Oh my goodness, how did we get to that time of the year again where I'm starting to get emails about transition? I know, I love it when people are starting to think ahead. Now, I will be doing my normal getting ready for 2025 later on in October and November and sending you out the transition tip sheets and things that I revise every year and update. But this podcast is really important because a lot of my secondary school students start transition now. So I thought it's really important to start getting our transition for secondary sorted now. Now, ideally, if you listen to this podcast last year, you start in year five. But this is a refresher with Joan Shanahan, who's amazing and she has transitioned so many students to secondary and she knows all the tips and tricks that you need to be aware of. But also, if you didn't have a great transition to secondary, you know, next year's a new year. Maybe you need to relook at some of these tips to set up year nine to be more successful. Or if you're looking to transfer schools because secondary hasn't been such a success. I also um, highly recommend you have a look at the blog because I have some of my favorite books on here that I truly believe are invaluable for our students. And the reason I believe they're invaluable because many of our students don't know what to ask. They're not sure what's appropriate to ask in secondary school. So the books I highly recommend is Autism, Bullying and Me. That is such a good book because it actually it has, it tells students about bullying and what to do and it comes from an autistic perspective. The Asperger Teens Toolkit, I love that book because again, A lot of my kids don't know what to ask, but they read the book and go, oh, I've experienced this. I get that. I think you've heard me talk about it before. It's like Dolly Doctor. I used to love reading Dolly Doctor as a kid. I'm showing my age. But any of you who like reading, you know, on Instagram where things pop up and you're like, oh, other people feel that way. For any of our girls on the spectrum, this is a must have. The Spectrum Girls Survival Guide, How to Grow Up Awesome and Autistic. It is a great book. A must, must, must have. And the other one both my boys and girls love is the Asper Kids Secret Book of Social Rules. This is great. It just tells you all the hidden rules. I mean, do you remember how confusing secondary is? Imagine if you are on the spectrum, how confusing it is because teenagers are very confusing. One day that you're friends, one day you're not. So the rules change from primary to secondary must prepare our students. I mean, for me, it's about puberty, hormones, so sensory, then we're changing classes all the time. We don't have just one teacher in class we get to know. You know, teenage is hard. It was hard for my kids to transition from their local primary school to their secondary schools, let alone neurodiverse students. So I would love you to hand this week's podcast, share it with someone you know that might have a neurodiverse child or even someone who's stressed about their child moving to secondary. I think there's some great tips in here for everybody. As I always say, I think these tips are invaluable. No matter neurotypical, neurodiverse, these will make a difference. So please make sure that you share this episode with anyone who you think could just do with some reassurance and guidance. What I love is in this podcast, we have the must do, then we have the ideal to do, and then we have the extra tips for success. And there is a PDF that goes with this that you can download with all of that, and you can tick it off and highlight which ones are relevant for each student. I think it's invaluable. So we it is a replay of last year's, but I think sometimes it is worth revisiting these things and I highly recommend you actually get on the page and look at the resources and download the PDF as a guide and please share it with other people because the only people way people find out about this podcast if you share with them. So I would really appreciate you sharing with someone you know. Thank you so much. Well, welcome everybody. I am super excited to have Joan Shanahan on our podcast today. Joan is experienced in transitioning so many children to secondary. And although our podcast today is going to do a deep dive into secondary and transitioning children, I do think that this podcast has top tips for anyone transitioning or moving schools. Even some of these tips will apply if you're moving from preschool to school. So Joan has had a huge amount of experience from early childhood through to tertiary. 
but she finally worked in her final role as a consultant with 24 schools in the northern New South Wales before moving to the Sunshine Coast and establishing her business, Behaviour Solutions 247, uh, which I highly recommend you have a look at the website because there's lots of great social stories and tips on there. And I'll make sure I link to it in the show notes, but make sure you have a look at that. But Joan brings a huge amount of experience, 20 years of developing transition plans for students. So I thought she'd be the perfect person about talking about moving from primary to secondary. So welcome, Joan. Thank you, Sue. So good to be back with you again. Fabulous. So Joan has kindly put together a fabulous one pager for us that I highly recommend you print out that has the must-dos, the ideal, and the extra for great success. But Joan, I just want to start off. Can you just tell us, in your experience, what are the key things we need to get going? What do we need to do? Well, I think the first thing is for us to realise that the student going into secondary school, it's no different to anything in our lives if we're going to do it for the very first time. We all have to plan. We all have to think about what's worrying us. How do we find solutions to what those concerns are and then start to plan for it and I think sometimes with secondary it's the adults who have the problem and they forget to ask the student what is your concern what is it that you want to know about secondary school and a lot of the children will say where the lockers are and where the toilet block is yeah but for some students like we had one student his highest anxiety was about the canteen and the temperature of the pie that he ate every day because he didn't want food poisoning. Oh. So the first thing he had to do was to take him to the canteen, that he brought a thing that he could measure what it was, the heating temperature. Then we could start addressing other issues about his integration and his actual transition. But that was his greatest fear, and that had to be you know, solved before we could start addressing other things. Totally. And you were telling me also about a student who was scared of storms, because I've had that a lot, and particularly with the Lismore and the floods we've had recently. So can you share that? Because I think that's one that a lot of my kids worry about, storms. Yeah, well, he was okay for the first two years in his secondary school, but when he had hit year nine, he'd been involved in a huge hailstorm where he was trapped in a car and they couldn't go, and the noise of it. And then we were having a lot of that sort of hailstorm in that area he was living in, and he just, as soon as he knew there was going to be a storm, he'd watch the weather forecast the night before, then he had this level of anxiety about being at the school. With some discussion with the principal and with the support teachers that supported him there, we worked out that if there was to be a storm, he could check it on his phone and he could ask to go to sick bay. Sick bay was dark, the curtains were full, and he felt safe. So we have, we actually established a safe place that suited him and that actually relieved his fears so he could get on with the rest of the things that he needed to have done. I agree. And a lot of my children, once you've established that, whether it's the pie or the sick bay, what to do, it's them knowing what to do so they don't wake up every day stressing, well, what if my pie isn't hot? What if my there's a storm? Because they actually know what to do. They've got those plans in place. And I like the fact you're saying that happened around year nine because I think sometimes in secondary there's a change from year, we do that transition from year six to year seven, but a lot of secondary schools now are moving where year nine to ten is another transition, like often there's separate learning areas in a school. So we have to be aware to go back and revisit because you might move year levels and the lockers move, the toilets move, all these new concerns can come up at different levels of in a secondary if it's a big school. Definitely, definitely. So with our visit, let's go back to your fabulous list. So with the visit to the school, when when how many visits in our dream world, when would how many visits would you have to the school? Till the child feels that they've got the information that they need. Totally. And, and this is not say it's turn one. No. And that's why we're doing this now, because I believe it, we should have a whole term to work on transition. Like there's no point me doing this podcast right. in November. We need to do it now so that we can plan. We might have to do 10 visits. And I, the big mistake I think people do is going to the school when there are no kids there because it's never going to look like that. You've, you don't go to the open no. day on the weekend when no one's there. You need to go when there's 100 kids in the locker area or 200 kids at the bus. Like I've just had a parent having trouble getting her son on the bus 
but they did all the practice when it wasn't full of school kids. Yeah. I think I think one of the, the big things that I, I've seen with the success was where Year 9 Media Group did a video of the school that was used for every kid who was coming, regardless of whether they had any kind of need. It was so that they had an idea of the sound when children moved between periods, whether they had a hooter that went off or whether there was a bell or whether there was music played. But what was the thing that told you you had to move on or whether children all had their own clocks? But that that sound impact is one thing. But the other thing that has a huge impact is the smell. So the smell of the lockers, the smell of the change room for when you're going to sport and PE, the smell when you're doing cooking, the smell when you're in the woodwork room. So those sensory needs are huge and you don't get them if you're not there when it's all happening. Agree, agree, because I had a boy who was a deodorant in the secondary. He'd never experienced all that links and all those smells in the secondary that happen in the change room. And also the other thing I'd say with sensory, in primary, often they don't have to wear leather school shoes. They can just wear their runners. And a lot of secondary, they have to wear different sort of shoes that they've never worn. And I'd say start wearing them in term four at primary school so they're worn in. You don't want new school shoes the first day. That's a whole sensory issue for many of my kids. I think you were saying one term. I really believe transition's a full year. Yeah. And it can go the, the year that they're there, once they arrive, it will go through all of that year as well, working out what's working, what's not. What were things that we never thought about? What are things that have happened that they didn't realise would happen? It just, but I, I really think in year five, parents who have a child that will need a transition plan need to look at schools because the school they think they might go to, they might find it doesn't meet the needs of their child. 100%. In fact, Anna Tallemans and I in our Essential Guide to Secondary School recommend the book from year five. That's when transition starts year five. Because the other thing... All the kids are starting to talk about their secondary and where they're going. By year six, Mm. most kids are already talking about it and that can cause a lot of anxiety for our kids because they're like, well, I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. So we should be doing all of that from year five. I agree. You know, the earlier the better. Now, one of the things on your tip sheet you recommended was the videoing, and I agree. I've had lots of schools get year nines to do the videos and it's amazing, and I think better than staff doing it because they tell the hidden rules. Like they'll say, oh, your phone goes in your locker or they'll they'll tell the things that are important for a teenager to know, not what adults think are important. You know, I, I had one school do a video and they were like, oh, don't don't sit outside the library. The librarian gets cranky if you eat your food outside of her the library. Well, most adults wouldn't think to say that, but that was good information to know. And the school left it in, and I think that's helpful. But you mentioned videoing the visit, and I'm a huge fan of videoing the visit so the child can replay it back over and over. But I've also found sometimes because the child's sensorily and emotionally overwhelmed, when I play back the video, they can ask me better questions. So, and they and after they've seen it a few times, they have completely different questions to what they originally had. Exactly, and so that's one of the reasons I like the videoing because in the moment they mightn't have time to process the questions, but when you rewatch it, they might go, "Oh, what's that on the locker? Oh, that's a lock. Oh, I need to learn the code for that lock." You know, but in the moment they mightn't have noticed how the locker was being locked. They were looking at something else. So. I think videoing all visits and I've also done a video where the key staff, we make sure we video them saying hello, showing their office, what to do if they're not in their office, you know, like this is my office, come here and here's the backup plan. I think one of the big things with with the transition, the very first orientation should be to the environment, then the people is the second part of the transition. Yeah. Because they've got to be secure in the environment because the people may change from that year to the following year. Yeah. But the environment and where people are located will be, be maintained generally. So if this person is the support staff person and they move, the next support staff person is generally the same area. So I love that. That's I love that. very important to the environment. Yeah. And I think the you other- had, had down to have a map. I find a map really yeah. important because – Often in primary school, they've been in the same environment for seven years. This is the first time they've moved to a big new environment. And I like a map. I like color coding the key areas. You know, the, 
and doing that with them, that co-active colour, like not me just presenting it, like let's colour in the key areas together and then like referring, remember we, that's where this person was, this is where the toilets. Because sometimes if they've been, especially some of the children you worked with that have been in a small primary school in a regional area, moving to a big secondary that's a massive change of environment. It's a huge school compared to what they're used to. And some schools have toilet blocks allocated to year levels too, so the kids can't use them if they you know, need to go and they've got to go all the way down to the other area. You know, that sort of thing can be um, a difficult thing to come to terms with. One of the things you are saying about, you know, where you can get, you know, it's a, you're unsure about something, where to go, I think one of the big things that they, the children need training in in the year before they go is the language to use so they don't stand out as being somebody who doesn't understand or that seems younger. So when you talk about the word help, I try to avoid using that for secondary school because, you know, this is where you go to get help. Well, you, you, you mustn't be able to cope, you know, if you need help. But if you say this is where you go to get assistance so you know where you have to go. Yeah. It's just the wordy. So... I don't like to use the word help. I always try to get children in year six to start using the word, I'm unsure about this, mm-hmm. instead of saying I don't know. Yeah. I, I I might know, but my anxiety means I can't express it, so I'm unsure. So that word unsure also means that when they're in a class, they can say I'm unsure, but if they say I don't know, then teenagers send to label people like that as dumb or, you know, so... Trying to get rid of I don't know or I need help to other ways of actually, you know, saying I need assistance or I'm unsure. And it's good adult language too to be using for the workforce later on. I love that. I love that. And I think that's one of the big things we have to remember that when they're hitting secondary, we've got the whole hormones, the whole teenage, we've got all the other teenagers being hypersensitive to difference, like it's just a normal developmental, isn't it? They become far more aware of things like a word a child might use or how they look or, you know, we the sensory tools, for example. Sometimes we have to be much more subtle. Have you got some examples of good sensory tools for our secondary? Well, I, I like happy sacks, especially if it's boys, because they can have them in their hands in their pockets but if they fall out it's just something they kick around like a little tiny soccer ball I like those wooden toys that you have yeah. that have the balls in them or blue tack or that sort of thing but none of the things that you see with younger children because that just automatically makes them stand out in the crowd yeah it's the same with the kids with headphones if you've got noise sensitive headphones that's you put them on a child in secondary school it's like putting a big target here I am here I am so I think it's really important to look at those ones that are Bluetooth ones now that just sit in all the kids use them. You know, try to think about what the child who's in secondary and especially teenage children can be very cruel in the kind of remarks that they give back. But I've seen kids where that's been accepted because the cohort has been accepted of it. You know, and then that comes back again to the leadership within the school setting. Are they the ones that convey this is acceptable and you are not to comment on those sort of yeah. things, you know? And you can't control that when you're coming to plan transitions because you don't know those personalities that may come in to that child's life. I agree, Joan. And I think when parents look at a school, I really think that, you know, that often I think it's you've got to look at the, you know, we'd all love to say, well, bullying shouldn't happen and teasing, but it does. And we need to go in, when you go and look at the school, it's important to notice that sort of stuff in the older kids. Like I tend to say, look at the year 11 and 12s. Are their kids wearing headphones and they're perfectly comfortable? Is the school, are kids, is there a culture where individuality is okay? Or are they a school where that sort of thing is going to create some challenges? And often talking to the older kids are the key or the parents of older kids at the school. And I know for many of my parents, their anxieties around the bullying and teasing, and I think that's a natural thing to be worried about. But sometimes that's our own experience of secondary that we're bringing to the table. I, I think too it's important in your transition planning that you have some mechanism, especially as parents, of how you unpack what's happening at school because if there is a concern or a problem and it's not being addressed and it's being compounded, 
you can end up with having a total school refusal and you're dealing with a whole different thing that's very hard to come back from. So sometimes some parents have diaries and the kids write a, like a debriefing in the afternoon when they get home so that if there is a problem happening that it can be addressed. I know that we had one boy in bus lines was problematic because the kids used to throw his backpack up in the tree and sometimes he'd miss the bus because he was trying to get his backpack down. But if that hadn't been brought up soon enough, it could have become a bigger problem where he didn't even go to bus lines to avoid that happening. Totally, totally. And this is where putting those systems in place in like year six where are they going to come home and write things down or some of my children will send a text message like, you yes. know, there. Are, but setting those systems up in, in year six so that when the child goes, it's not another new thing to be doing in year seven. So you actually got some of those systems in place where, okay, we want you to write it down or we want you to text and trying them because you don't know which one's going to work for your child. So trying some of those systems, which brings me to one of the big things you're saying about not asking for help and ask using the word assistance or I'm unsure. So many of my secondary children do not want a teacher assistant with them in secondary. They do not want someone coming in and being with them. Have you got any solutions around how they can get assistance without standing out? Because that's just a normal stage, I think. One of my most extra great success stories was a school where they actually, before COVID, they put QR codes into their woodwork room, into their cooking room, and the children could scan it and it would tell the equipment that they needed and what safety things they needed to do before they sat down. Wow. So that avoided having an adult telling and explaining. It's also an extra sort of structure for what when happens when you go to the workforce, you know, that you're independent. So the children who could be independent and cope, they use QR codes in those specialised rooms. Science lab, if they were doing experiments, the same thing. So it did but that's listed the, everything, just so I'm clear, you scanned over the QR code so they're allowed their phones in class? Yes. And then it lists everything they need for that session? Yes. Fabulous. So that's... That's with children who can cope with that. But there are children who can't do that mm. and they need to have an educational assistant. But I like to see them being used with the class while the teacher comes and helps the child. Absolutely. So that's what the teachers are the experts in, in that area. So that would be good. The other thing I've seen is where they have peer mentoring, where they have a buddy that actually helps those. And it's with they peer them, they pair together. Only for that lesson, not for every lesson, because then it becomes too demanding of the other students. But they actually pair them up so that they're not choosing the pairs and every child with their pair goes and does it. Not doing this just for one child. This is done for the whole class. So they're all a part of the same support. I love that. And the thing I've found over the years is normally in secondary there'll be a couple of subjects my kids are really good at. So what I like to do is in those situations, they're the peer mentor. So if they're really good at maths, I'll pair them with a student who's not so good at maths. So they get an opportunity to be the teacher and the mentor and the helper. So they don't always feel like they are being helped, you know, that, that they can actually get an opportunity to shine. And I think those pairings are so important in secondary because if we let children choose who they're with, my experience, some of my children on the spectrum choose a complete wrong partner, someone they should never be with. They're just often attracted to the wrong child or they end up with someone else who doesn't know what to do, which isn't helpful either. So, it, At school where in year seven they actually work as what they call clock partners, a really good yeah. where they got them and the teacher then can say, they actually keep a record, don't ever use one o'clock because all those kids in one o'clock partnerships are the wrong partners, yeah. you know. So that that's that's it's up to the teachers but really to how they act, work their classroom and how well they want it to work. Yeah, totally, totally. So back to your fabulous list, one of the things you had down there was about getting the timetable. Now, I definitely, if we know what school the kids are going to for term four of year six, I normally, and often year six teachers, the kids are ready. They're getting excited and anxious. Mm. So I would go to the feeder schools, get their timetable and get the children to start getting used to if they're on an eight day, because they often go from Monday being called Monday to being day one, day two. So I try mm. and introduce that language in year, term four of year six. So the kids are 
seen that I just photocopy the diary from the school they're going to. So they're used to writing in that diary and getting those systems in place in year six. So they're familiar with the day names, the diary, how it looks, how to use it. Because, again, it's just all too much if you do it all in the start of year seven. Oh, it's too overwhelming. And sometimes in secondary school they work on a two-week cycle or, like you said, it can be a six-day cycle and and that means every Monday is a different Monday. Correct. And, and it's, it's confusing to everyone, let alone somebody who's never done it before. Exactly. And I think all the kids need to get used to that because one of the schools that one of my students fed into, if it was a long weekend, then the you'd never missed a day because of like long weekends or Easter's. It was the days went numbered no matter what. So the, the you uh, a Tuesday could be a day eight. You know there was no logic. Even the teachers found it really hard to know what was happening. But it was so I think, you, you didn't never missed a day in the curriculum. I think it's really good to go to the school with the timetable yeah. and actually walk them through it so that they start. They don't have to be in the classroom, but they start at the classroom door. This is where you have to be. What books would you need? Then where you go the next lesson and to, so they actually physically walk through doing that. Yeah. And I think transition is wonderful if they'll allow them to sit at the back of the classroom so they get a feel for how a class is run, what a different subject looks like, all of those sorts of things that, that are so different from a primary school where you're in one classroom and you don't very re- rarely go out of it other than go to the library. I think secondary, they have a lot of them have agricultural blocks what's it like to go down to that block very different kind of things some secondary schools are paired with other secondary schools and they actually meet at a different school location so it's knowing the school and how the school operates but learning that timetable and learning how to walk around and find your way there the other thing I think if you do that with the video and then you see what it looks like to be walking they get an idea of the number of movement of students when there's that change of period that's huge because that's where some children find it overwhelming with their sensory needs a hundred, and often just go to the yeah, toilet. Uh, uh, what you're saying then, Joan, is so important and I think letting kids just sit and observe and the same with the locker area. I like to like a lot of locker areas that say down if it's two-storey, letting the students sort of go in a less busy part and letting them watch everyone come in and out, the flow of that chaoticness of kids throwing things and all the stuff happening that happen in those transition. Anna Tallerman's son described it like shopping at Westfield at Christmas. Yes, and that's as busy as that. It really is. Yeah, all the bags, the people, everyone focused on what they need to do, their head down, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So I love that. I love that. Toilet blocks are a huge problem. I I haven't got any easy answers for secondary. Have you got any good ideas for toilet blocks? Depends on the school, but I know in one school that I worked in, they had an outside one that was used like for um, visitors and it was one toilet and that became that student's toilet. It wasn't given to other students. It was just for that student. Sometimes they can use the toilet block that's in the administration centre because I think it, it, it's a new school. It's new schools I've been in, they've got great toilet blocks because there's no urinals, no boys, no girls. It's an open area and you just walk in and lock the door. Yeah. It makes vision a lot easier. But in the older schools, the toilet blocks are the place from hell because they never know when they walk through what they're going to find, more so with boys than girls because it's so open and then they comment on each other and they we on somebody's shoes or, you know, yeah. it can be just so horrible. Yeah, yeah. But then some of my girls, when they've got their periods, they're scared because not every toilet might have the the bin to put it in or, and the, there's a lot of fear around that and there's a lot of sensory around having periods too in secondary. So, again, that's where a personal toilet or an individual toilet, thinking of all those needs are just so important when we transition. Mm. and has to be asked mm. because it's too late once they're there. Yeah. You've already created a problem. Yeah. There, I think transitions about finding the solution when it happens or before it happens, but not after it's been going on for a month. No. And, and, yeah. and that's why I'm saying this podcast is helpful no matter what. If you're transitioning from year eight to nine or if you're, 
you're seeing a change in a child, let's you can still go back and put in place some of these strategies and try and work out what's going on and solve the problems. So one of the things you had down the student rights and introduction, I mean, I like them to do that every year. It's part of their transition where they introduce themselves. Can you tell us a little bit how that how you think that works well? What should they have in that introduction? Well, some children want to write a book because they think that they, every, they should know everything about them. So getting the child to understand it's what works for you, a bit about yourself, what your interests are, because that when a child's very anxious, if you want to talk about their dog at home or something, that just allows that the calming to come back. But it's really important to know their real interest level and what really works for them and what doesn't. Because mm-hmm. some children will say, I don't like it when the teacher stands over me at my shoulder and asks me, am I all right? I don't want them to do that. And then what can you do so that doesn't happen? So I know for one of our students or and a couple of the girls, we actually used a colour highlighter that when that was on the desk, it means I can't get started and I don't know what I have to do. 100%. So the teacher then can be oriented and, and come and, and see them. I had another student who used to just flip their ruler over so the, the round part was underneath, it was flat on top. It's just stopping that attention of being drawn to them in the class. They want assistance, but they don't want it to be so obvious as always asking in every single lesson, are you all right? Do you know what you have to do? But it just draws that attention and it makes a, them a mark within the class. I, I also think how would you feel if you went to work and everyone was always checking in on you? Like we have to remember that they're young adults or they're becoming teenagers, there's a normal developmental stage that they want to move away from relying on adults or old people as that we seem to them. And I think this is where we have to remember that imagine if someone was sitting next to you at work and no one else had that. Like they're very hypersensitive to these things. So that's why your thing saying getting the teacher to come to the student. But when I go into classrooms, I never walk straight up to the student I'm there to see. I go and work with some other students first and then come so they don't feel so targeted by me coming in, you know, that. And also I would never, one of the things I've learned over the years that get, sending someone to pick this child up to talk to, you know, send the child to, don't get someone to come to the room to get the child for a meeting because that someone coming in saying, oh, you're needed for whatever, this then the child feels actually really traumatised often by that. It's better that, the t- you know, that A, they get reminded they've got that meeting or send them out on a job, you know, so that the other kids don't know they're going to the school counsellor. Like find more subtle, appropriate ways and more sensitive to the teenage needs with their peers. And I think it, it's transitioned to secondary, but this is the start of a long-term six years of transition that will be to the work, yeah, you know, or to a tertiary university. So we've got to develop skills, not just build support mechanisms so they can only exist in this environment. We're trying to build skills so they can be self-sufficient. So when something's not working, where do you go to get assistance for the solution to the problem? And... Not always will mum turn up to solve it. Not always will it be the support staff to solve it. It's got to be collaborative. So building that thing that we sit down and we talk about it, and sometimes I find that you say, well, you've got a problem with this. Can you find some other thing that might work for you? The child can find the solution. I agree. You know, like, you know, so- sometimes the children say, well, I'm not going to catch the bus anymore. I'm going to walk. Yeah. You know, like there can be a solution that, that they come up with and that once that is that empowering of them to be able to decide what they will do so the problem goes away is is the first step for being an adult absolutely and in Anna and my trans uh, essential guide to secondary we talk a lot about remembering their adult learners and preparing them for that adult and I always say begin with the end in mind so if if drama is a disaster in year eight are they going to be doing drama in year 11 and 12 Probably not. Well, how about we spend extra time on English or maths? Like sometimes we need to think, well, what is the big goal here? What is the end point? You know, how, where are we building towards that? But getting them to realise it rather than us making all the decisions. Like, okay, well, if I'm not going to do drama, what am I going to do in that time? What are important things to me? And getting them far more proactive in their decision-making gives them that autonomy that 
and advocating that a teenager wants. So I couldn't agree more with that. That is so some, some children's transition can go for a length of time, even more than one year, mm-hmm. in that, that they can't be there the full day because some things by the afternoon is just too much. So some kids become partially enrolled. Yeah. And they come for those subjects and then they do the other sec- other subjects online. There's lots of answers and alternatives to just, you know, come to school and be in a mainstream setting. I mean, some schools have mainstream and they have a satellite class that they can attend when this is too much, you know. So that's why going when you are thinking about enrolling a child and going when they're in year five allows time for you to look at the kind of setting they're going to because you don't want to transition them to one school and it's not working. Now we've got to find another school. So all that anxiety is another whole 12 months of build-up. Yeah. And I just would say, though, if it's not working, don't, like, move schools. My experience is, like, sometimes you've just got to go, look, I know we had our heart set on this school. We thought this was the right school, but it's not working. It's okay to think about moving schools. But sometimes when I say to the child, well, do you want to move schools? And I give them that option. It's not, they go, no, I'm happy here. They've just been telling me all the problems. Does that make sense? But when I go, well, do you want to move? They're like, no, no, I just, you know, I'm no, because just. Because what- the school is now familiar to them and that's a familiar place that feels safe. Yeah. I, I think it's really important, but in in this concept of transition to secondary, in some of our smaller towns in Australia, there is no other option. That mm-hmm. There is only one secondary school. It's a small town and it might have six or eight feeder schools or even more that are coming but it is that they don't have an option of anywhere else. No. So that's why transition, if it is carefully planned and all of the kind of possible solutions being looked at, then you get the best chance of it actually working. Totally. And, Joan, what you're saying about the feeder schools coming in, that has been one of the things I would often say to parents. Look where the supportive peers are going. Like that. that is if you've got – if you do have options – I know you might think that school has the best academic, but teenagers' social is more important for them personally. Social is more important than academic. And if they're not happy socially, you're not going to get the academic anyway. So sometimes if you're a child, their friends are important. If they are a neurodiverse child whose friendships are important, I would look where their friends are going because making friends is hard. So if you've got a few good mates going to that school, good girlfriends, that can make a big difference to some of my children's anxiety. So if, if the school allows them to be put into the same class, it's great. But some schools, they break them all up. Yeah. And so it's you, that's why you've got to start earlier to talk about what's going to be possible. Yeah. And what the school's prepared to do. Yeah. And if their friends, the thing I would say I've learned from parents, like if their friends aren't going there, which is the Michael Carr Greg stuff, the psychologist in Melbourne who's into team, he says it's important they have three peer groups. So if their friends aren't going to that school, though, you need to make sure you create connection, ensure they stay connected to those friends, not just online, like organize catch ups or get them all to join the same netball team or make sure that there's some connection to their old primary school friends. That's actually an important part so that. If everyone's vaping at the school they go to, but their friends from primary school aren't, they've got a bit of a comparison or set point to not everybody does that. Yes. We'll come back to vaping. Yeah, well, we're running out of time, Joan. We've got such a big list. This is going to be like... No, no, I was, I was going to say, I think in the transition it's really good if they are actually paired with an older mentor, whether it's a couple of years up, that will be there it checks in with them when they're on the playground. Yeah. And the playground is the big area that I think the parents need to ask about. Are there alternatives to going to the playground? Is the library open? Do they have clubs? Are there other vegetable groups or, you know, ones that do all the veggie garden patch? But there are places they can go because some find that competitive sport-oriented playground time's a nightmare. It is a nightmare. I think it's a complete nightmare. I agree. So don't just look at the academics, look at the social. I couldn't agree more. Yes. Now, we I did ask on Facebook if people had questions, but I can actually answer all of them in a second podcast later. But can the ones I really wanted to cover, Joan, though, was about 
the bus, any recommendations for the bus? Because that is a big thing for so many of my children catching the bus after. So I think it was um, Naomi wanted to know, my year, year 11, who is in year five, is quite anxious and worried how he will deal with the types of kids he'll come across on the bus. I think I'd have to know whether that person is a city-based person or a country-based person because country buses are school-based buses and you can go to the bus company and meet with them, talk about your child and their needs. And the ones that we have dealt with always have either the first seat or the second seat directly behind. So the bus driver can see them and know where they are and it avoids what happens down the back of the buses. So location on the bus sitting towards the front where the adult is is really important. Totally. I agree. If it's the city where they're just catching normal buses, you've got a whole different sort of structure and maybe that's something that needs to be looked at that where the child's actually travelling with a companion or with an older kid that's at the school and they sit together. So it's 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 different on, you know, council-based buses compared to school-based buses. Yeah. Well, one of the workarounds I've had in Sydney is the student, because they don't like doing homework when they get home, they stay at school if the library's open or if there's a local, like often there's a community library near the school that's open. They go there, do their homework and catch the later bus when there isn't all the school kids running, getting on the bus. So or that later train. So you, they actually fixes two problems. One, that they don't want to do their homework when they get home. And lots of their year 11 and 12s go to the library. So often then they can create on the bus with those older kids. And they often are really great kids to be friends with and to be those mentors. So I found that the other thing I've done is actually pay one of those year 11 and 12s to be a tutor. So they... And Anna Tullerman's taught me this one. So actually then that child is being paid to be their tutor after school, but also then watches out for them and becomes like, they're sort of like a paid mentor or advocate. And often then they'll catch the bus home or the train home together. So you're creating that relationship in starting off as a tutor, but then ends up being that connection. So I've, I mean, they're just workarounds and you've just got to keep looking for those workarounds. And Anna would say it's better to get a student who's actually at the school as a tutor because they know the teachers, they know the, what's being said in class more than an adult outside that school setting. Definitely. Yeah. Especially around maths and how maths is taught yes. and science. Yeah. And even English, the requirements, um, you know, English is such a depends on the teacher, what they like. So, yeah, great. Okay. We want to do vaping. So the question, Colleen made this point, and I think this is really important, that she wished she had this podcast last year that we're doing this topic. My girl just started year seven and we feel we did not prepare her properly in lots of ways. So I'm hoping anyone listening is feeling a lot more prepared and they download the tip sheet to go with this. But vaping was a big issue. So can you talk us through vaping? Because it is a big issue. It, it, it's, it's a huge issue and it's not just in the toilet block mm-hmm. because we have cases of where they're doing it in the classroom mm-hmm. and then you've got to video yourself and then put it online to show that you've actually done it in the classroom. So it's a big challenge. I think it's really important that, that when you, the parent is looking at the school that they ask those questions of the school. How is it handled at the school? What, what happens and what Things have been put in place. Are, are, are they got set, you know, fire sensors in the toilet block? Mm. You know, things like that. I mean, I, I think some schools haven't really sat down and had a really big think about it. It's really probably only been a thing of the last three years Great. where it's really taken off and it's because of social media and people posting that they do it. I know. I, I, keep, ask, I keep asking who, who buys these? Are they bought online? How do they actually do this? Um. But for these children, I think they have to be taught that not not about right or wrong, just you don't do it and if somebody's doing it, what do you do? You don't make comment, you shouldn't do this, this is wrong, so that you're not setting them up to be in an attack from the other teenager. Talk about removing yourself to another place where it's not happening. Totally. So, so you move out, you go to the library block or you, you move out or you go somewhere else. But it's, we, you don't want to create this thing where they become the police officer and also then they become the victim of the other teenagers in how they react to it. 
I think that's that's the most important thing. I mean, I'm going back to smoking when I worked in a high school. We had the same thing that the smokers always smoked in the same spot. So when we did orientation, we said, when you come to school, there are going to be kids smoking down there. The teachers know it. Kids have smoked down there for 100 years. You don't need to dob. You don't need to notify any staff members because in primary school, that would be a notify someone situation. In high school, it's not your problem. And getting them to, and it's a little bit the same with alcohol, you know, a lot of our kids with any of those rules being broken, they become mini police officers. And then the other kids don't respond well to that, to being dobbed on. I think that's why that, that debriefing time after school is really important because you have to be able to say, you know, what went wrong today and what you do about it and, and what you what you don't need to do about it. Yeah. Because that becomes the thing that they worry all night over and then they become anxious the next day whether they should tell or not tell. Uh, but in, in the debriefing, that can be sort of sorted through. A hundred percent, Joan. And sometimes my children, that's, well, children, they're not children, they're young teens. That's when they go to bed that they suddenly start thinking about these things and worrying about them. So even though you might have set up a system to journal at after school or to write your note, you can actually say, if you wake up in the night and think of something, write it down and we'll talk about it in the morning. That's a, very important to have, you know, plan Bs and Cs with because often it's once they're quiet in their room, lights out, oh, I forgot to tell mum and dad about this situation. I think the, the journal has to be a positive thing too. Yes. That you, they must write at least one or two things that went really well. That's what they finish with each time. Don't finish on a negative that this went really well today and tomorrow I'm going to have a go at doing this. So it's love it. It's future oriented. Absolutely. Now, I would love to finish on that note, but I just want to do one more because this is important and you had some good ideas how the, the children don't like the lunch boxes. They don't want to take their primary school looking lunch box. So what's your workaround around that one? Well, I, I always think that the first two years in secondary school is I'm a teenager and I don't have a do, no hat, no play rule. It doesn't work anymore. And I don't want any pretty lunch boxes and all those things that make you a child, they don't want that orientation towards. I think an easy way is looking at what you're packing because if you're packing sandwiches, you need something so they don't get all mulchy and they can't eat them. So if you can turn to muesli bars and things like that or use the canteen, but even just simple, those takeaway kind of Chinese plastic things that are just plain, the plainer the better. No pretty pictures on them, no unicorns, no Spider-Man. You know, <laughs> no love hearts. Things. No, no. darling. It, no. <laughs> and and, and it, I said to one mother, I know your notes are really important, but when they open it, it falls on the ground and the other children see that I love you today. That it doesn't work in t with teenagers. It can be – makes them a target. Yeah. And that's – the best thing is anything that makes them a target, avoid it or change it. I love it. And I think that's a really good note to finish on, to really think and look what the peers are taking for their lunch. Like really when you go for those orientations, have a look what kids have got, what are they using and setting the kid up for success by thinking, well, they are a young teenager and they do want to leave primary school behind and also moving to the workforce. They're not going to have little love notes in their lunch box when they go to the workforce. So I think we need to remember this is a transition to secondary, but then also setting them up for the workforce in the, the big picture. Well, thank you, Joan. So good to have you on the podcast. It's all your wealth of knowledge. And I highly recommend everyone goes to your website and checks out some of the great PDFs and social scripts and things they can download too to support the kids. And you've got lots more on there beyond transition. And I'll definitely get you back on to talk about behavior at some stage. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. It's been wonderful. Well, I hope you found that really helpful. Remember, I really think you should be starting transition from year five. As always, there's a PDF with all the tips, with everything that um, Joan recommends and more than that was discussed in the podcast. So make sure you check your emails for the PDF. I know you probably get sick of me saying that or check on my social media or on my um, blog to download the tips. I've also would recommend the Essential Guide to Secondary School. If you're listening to this when the podcast goes live, it's going to be $10 off because I think that book should be started 
started actually in year five. And I wrote that book with Anna Tallemans, who is a parent. So we put in that book everything her son Daniel needed for secondary school. And we really believe the earlier you can start some of those skills, the better. Um, and if you have any questions or challenges, please let me know. And remember, even if you've had swapping schools, there's some really important things to do. Um, you know, if you've started high school or secondary and moving schools, there's some good things in this podcast for you and in the tip sheet. Or um, if you're having a child, you know, just the whole new school year is like a whole new world anyway. So I highly recommend that you download the tip sheets to go with today. Um, and I hope that you found this helpful. I was just thinking, I know there's so many podcasts available at the moment, so I appreciate you choosing to listen to my podcast. And just a reminder, if you know anybody who maybe has a child who's transitioning to secondary and may be stressed about it, it could be really nice to share this episode with that family, um, just because it is a really nerve wracking time for families. I sometimes find families um, become quite stressed during this time. I would say, um, you know, really concerned if they're going to make the right decision and have a lot of worries, which are very real. Um, Often thinking about their own time in secondary school and thinking how hard it was from themselves. I mean, my daughter Eliza just said to me this morning, she goes, I always said during high school that it was an awful time and everyone who says high school's the best years, um, it's not true. And she said, I still believe that. She'd um, gone to see the play fangirls and um, it's all about teenagers and when Eliza was in secondary, she was in love with One Direction. So she was reliving her high school years and telling me, no, it's still, I still look back at high school as a horrible time. So, and, you know, she's neurotypical and found it really challenging. So please put yourself in the student's shoes. Remember yourself in high school, how challenging it could be. And I just learned over the years with my own kids, sometimes just going, yeah, it's hard. You know, transition from primary to secondary is hard. Please just acknowledge to kids how hard that is. And if possible, you know, just be that safe space and that listening space that they need. So hope today has inspired you to put in place some strategies. And um, I hope that you can share this with other people who may also be going through that transition to secondary and trying to support their neurodiverse children to have a successful transition.